Good morning. And a very warm welcome to church this morning. We're still in the Easter season, a time of praise and celebration. I like the fact that Lent, which is truthfully a bit somber, lasts for 40 days. But Easter, which is the opposite, lasts for 50 days. And we're already in the fourth Sunday of the season and we move on from the actual resurrection stories to think about the continuing life of the risen Jesus in our own lives. And today we think of Jesus as the good shepherd. And this is one of the most popular images of Jesus. And the picture here of the good shepherd is from the catacomb in Rome from the middle of the third century. And Protestant images of the uh, Good Shepherd are about as kitsch as the uh, Catholic Sacred Heart pictures, as you see. So we're going to stick to the original. <laughs> we're going to begin with a psalm of praise, the Psalm 100. And in the between the, the verses, we're going to sing Hallelujah. So maybe uh, Rosario and Alessandro, who, Rosalina, sorry, and, and uh, Alessandro, who we welcome back, as always, are going to sing the Alleluia, and then in the subsequent verses, we will respond ourselves as well. joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Alleluia. and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Alleluia. with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Alleluia. steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Alleluia.
let's stand to sing praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Let us pray. You watch over your creation, a shepherd with whom all living things are safe. You know us all and keep us wherever we move. O oh God, do this, we ask you, all the days of our lives. May we never want and may we never enter your rest. And may we enter your rest and know your peace today and every day of our lives. Amen. First reading is from the Gospel 1 John, chapter 3, verses 16 to 24. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need 
and yet refuses help. That's quite a biggie, actually. <laughs> Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Another biggie. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit that he has given us. Praise be to God.
And our second reading is taken from John chapter 10, verse 11 through 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd, does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have no other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be no one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. Blessings. Amen. Sing again, the Lord's my shepherd, Psalm 23. Thank you. 
Morning, everyone. Now, I don't know if you are aware that April the 23rd is coming upon us. Well, you're probably aware of that because it's not that far off. Um, but I don't know if you're aware that that's uh, our patron saint's day, St. George's Day. Some people's patron saint. <laughs> <laughs> Most people's patron saint. <laughs> A miserable style. <laughs> um, and it's of course also Shakespeare's birthday, but um, and also the anniversary of his death, which is always a little strange. But this, what I'm going to talk about this morning, really has nothing to do with Shakespeare, I'm afraid. Just before I tell you this story of St. George, which I found recently, and I quite like because I think the symbolism it speaks to us in our modern times really quite powerfully. There are some things I should explain to you that are within the story that are part of the symbolism of the story. But one of the things I love about St. George is, of course, originally he was from Turkey, um, and he then became a Roman soldier. And somehow he finds his way into rural England in this story. Quite how that happens, nobody knows, but it happens. So I love all those connections. But within the story, there are some symbols. There's obviously a dragon. Now, dragons in um, rural England um, in the past, and in fact some places still today, have a mixed symbolism. They both represent the dark ravages of winter and all that that's done to the land, but they also represent um, the kind of rush of water that you get in springtime. When the weather was colder and we had meltwater coming down from the hills and the mountains, rivers and um, streams would suddenly become full of water and these become these gushing torrents. And they're referred to even today, I think in Derbyshire you'll find in some parts, they're referred to as dragons. And it's a name that is, is also given to streams that appear because the underground reservoirs have filled up with the water from winter. So I don't know how climate change is going to affect all of that, but um, we are seeing more bournes. Those are the, um, the rivers that come from the underground reservoirs. We're seeing those appear more these days because we have so much rain. Um, certainly we had it this year, didn't we? Um, so that's one symbolism to bear in mind. Um, the other is, of course, the colour blue, which is important in this story. And you may be aware that blue in medieval paintings is usually used to represent the Virgin Mary. It's the colour of purity, but of course it's also the colour of, of open skies, of sunny skies, and of pure, clean water. Okay, I think that's all you need to know. Let me tell you the story. So there was once a little village that nestled at the foot of a hill. It was, in the main, a peaceful village except for one thing. Beyond the hill lived a dragon, and when winter was over and spring was coming, the dragon would wake up and it would be hungry, and it would demand food from the villagers. That was its only source of food. At first they would feed it livestock, cattle, pigs, whatever they could, but that didn't satiate its hunger. It wasn't enough. And so, sadly, from the dragon they learned that the only thing that would, bring, would satisfy it would be a young woman from the village each year. So every year, a young woman dressed in white with a blue sash around her would have to be led to the cave where the dragon lived and be left there as a sacrifice to the dragon. Well, one year, a man called George turned up. How he got there, we don't quite know. But he was a soldier in the Roman army, perhaps left behind once the Romans started retreating. And he heard the story from the villagers and was distressed by it. And he thought, I'm going to do something about this. So that year, instead of a young woman being led to the dragon's cave, he said he would go in their place. And he went to the spring on the edge of the village, which was a holy spring, splashed himself in its water and prayed and put a blue sash on him. But before he left, he made sure to fill his flask with some of the water from that spring. Then he made his way to the cave where smoke was emanating from its entrance. And then he heard a terrible roaring and fiery flames started to flash out of the cave. And then the dragon's terrible, awesome head appeared, its beady eyes fixed on George. It said, you're not a woman. You're not even a young woman. What are you doing here? George laughed, opened his flask just as the dragon was about to open his mouth and unleash a horrible flame. 
and threw the holy water all over the dragon's head, of course, immediately extinguishing the flame, but somehow completely changing the dragon's mood. A few hours later, George led the dragon back down to the village. He had put the blue sash around the dragon's neck and was leading it on a lead down into the village. The villagers were terrified, all shrank back into their houses. But George called out and said, don't worry, the dragon's not going to eat you anymore. We've made peace. And the dragon eventually settled on a grassy plain on the edge of the village. It eventually merged into the landscape and was seen no more. But from then on, every year, a roaring stream would appear where the dragon lay. And the villagers would toss in corn dolls with a blue sash around their neck in memory of the sacrifices they'd made. Thank you. Well, we've heard two incredibly beautiful and inspiring passages of scripture this morning. And they take us right into the heart of who Jesus is. He calls himself the good shepherd. And that did not come from nowhere. Shepherds featured prominently in everyday life in Palestine. And no doubt the majority of them were very good. The care of a shepherd for his sheep would be familiar enough to the hearers. Jesus, and no doubt many at the time, were also aware of the ones who were not so reliable. They would be the casual laborers, the people hired to cover for the owner. They would be the ones who did not have a personal stake in the sheep, their welfare and the contribution ownership of livestock would give to the household economies. This may be just a personal observation, but I am quite often surprised that people invest time and care in the organizations that they work for on a day-by-day -day basis. Obviously, there are exceptions, but generally, you receive a good service in shops, cafes, Staff are friendly, helpful more often than not, and it does show when someone has an investment in the place they work. And perhaps we should appreciate the more there is dignity in work. And it is dehumanizing then for someone who does not feel sufficiently invested in their workplace to care. And Jesus knows that the hired hand is unlikely to care for the sheep, whereas the owner has a deep sense of responsibility for the welfare of the animals and the economic advantages they bring. And it would be very easy to put a Thatcherite gloss on this, and no doubt some have. There is no such thing as society, only individuals, so the most important thing is private ownership. And the measure of success is wealth and ambition are to possess things. Status is derived from the quantity of goods and accumulated wealth. We use the words own and ownership in diverse ways. We own a pair of shoes and clothes. We own personal items, including ornaments, books, photographs, utensils, souvenirs, and all sorts of items. Some are lucky to own their own house. But even if you don't own where you live, you may still call it my home. It's a personal space where you belong, can rest, and which creates and contains memories. And some of our possessions are very personal, Passports, birth certificates, marriage certificates, they record our identity. They sort of say who we are, but only in a very formal sense. And we may use possessive pronouns in other ways. My partner, my parents, my children, my country, my cat. Ownership then transcends 
possession, into belonging, into relationships. And we resist relationships which are over-possessive and seek in our relationships to build and create mutuality. And we live in a society with a very distorted sense of values. Those who do own their own home are very privileged. Those who own more than one home are especially privileged. And if you also own a yacht and a private jet, then you are extra especially advantaged. Indeed, it's a feature of our times that there are some people whose level of ownership has become completely out of hand. Wealth has gone beyond being a comfortable cushion against adversity, nothing particularly wrong with that, to an obscenity of overindulgence. And perhaps the greatest of the obscenities is the capitalist treatment of what ought to be common possessions. Think of natural minerals, air, water, and a habitable earth. They belong to us all, but countries and corporations have placed a flag in the ground where they had no right to make a claim. And it's extraordinary that negotiations are taking place to determine ownership of space. That's really happening. Possession cannot be purely individual. And in observing the lack of care and irresponsibility of the hired hands, Jesus is not advocating the sort of individualism of our contemporary age or the amassing of wealth characteristic of the global elite. He is, however, talking of his own relationship with his disciples and his beloved community of believers. It's an intense relationship rooted in the deepest love. His life was a deep expression of intimacy, friendship, compassion, caring, fondness. He rooted this relationship in his willingness to surrender all for the sake of the fellowship of those he called into discipleship. His individual identity was not the most important thing to him. The community he was forming required a willingness to sacrifice, to give up, to surrender, to lose, that others might gain. And Jesus is our savior because he demonstrated in his very being that he loved humanity. And his love was not possessive at all. His is a circular relationship. He loves because God loves him, his humanity. He loves us because God, his Father, is love. And we can then abide in him because Christ abides in God. In John's writing, we encounter that beautiful word, abide. If the ultimate aspiration of humanity is to be with God, then we achieve it simply by abiding in Christ. And it's worth contemplating this pattern of being. We are in Christ by virtue of belonging to each other in a community of believers. Christ is in us by virtue of his tender shepherding and the intimate care and love he has for his followers. God is in Christ by virtue of the gift of God's grace demonstrated in his presence in humanity. Christ is in God by virtue of the intimacy of his love for God's creation. So we are in God through Christ. These glorious, ever intertwining circles weave rich patterns of goodness and love. There is a film, The Wolf of Wall Street. It's one of a genre of films exposing corruptions and dirty dealings in financial affairs. But the title feels an apt in association with today's reading. Just as the good shepherds of Israel had to contend with wolves, our contemporary world has the same challenges. Yet it is not only the big time mafia types who threaten. The thirst for material possessions, the constant barrage of enticements, the pressures, particularly unfairly on young people, to follow fashion, trends and accumulate things run counter to the vision 
of a community rooted in valuing the commons and caring for people. Our individualistic society is all pervasive. We have a culture of taking more than you give, expecting a return on kindness, a dividend on charity. One of the worst meetings I had when I was the CEO of a charity was with someone from the private sector who was offering me free advice. And he tried to show me how to work out how much money we had saved the public purse because of the work that we were doing. We could then argue to government that charity is good for the economy and saves the government purse. He was seriously annoyed, actually he was very annoyed, when I refused to accept that we should monetize the kindness, hard work and care of our staff. I much prefer John's epistle, which is much more to the point, although it does concern, contain a, a severe rebuke. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a sibling in need and yet refuses help? This is both a prophetic and a personal question. Prophetic because it challenges the world to a different order. It stands in opposition to economies built on individual gain and fueled by weaponry of war. A society which has privatized and in so doing contaminated the commons of resources, water, land, air. And it's personal because it invites each of us into a new space, a new commonwealth, the commonwealth of God. A place of belonging, renewal, where we can rest ourselves, feel at home affirm our identity in Christ, whether we have a passport or not. We need our own things to get on with our lives. But when the chips are down, it matters far more that we are owned by Christ than that we own material goods. Owned by the good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep. We belong to each other in a new and unique way, because we are all cared for and protected by the Good Shepherd. And the invitation is to know that Christ loves us so deeply that we belong in the embrace of a truly compassionate God. Jesus says he wants one flock and one shepherd, because there are others he needs to call into the fold of his care. And I cannot interpret that in any sort of sectarian way. His flock are all who need care and protection. They are those who are marginalized from healthy, functioning societies, who are prey to the wolves of Wall Street and the predators of environmental degradation and militarism. We, who are members of the fold, the beloved community, have a special duty of care toward them, a duty of care an attitude of openness, which comes from obedience to the commandments of Christ. And in that obedience, we surrender worldly expectations and choose to live for others. In so doing, we receive the greatest treasure of all, our abiding in Christ. Amen. Sing, let your living water flow.
So this is a poem I wrote this week. Um, before I read it, I should explain a term which may or may not be familiar to you. It's a term that's usually used as an insult. Um, the word sheeple, I don't know if you've ever heard that, but it means basically when it's used as an insult, somebody who blindly follows a movement and doesn't think for themselves, okay? So this is called Life Laid Down. I have a confession to make. But let me warn you before I speak. You might think I'm mad, wrong, weak, delusional. You might think I don't have the right to speak. I have no brain, or if I did once, I've turned it off. You might think I should be silenced with a finger pu pushed on my lips, a hand in my face. Because, because, because I choose to be a sheeple, a sheep person. And let me tell you why. When our own leaders are concerned about keeping power and disempower those who are already losing hope by digging a deeper pit of poverty for them to fall into, when the wired air of the media distracts us with the slander that we should be most afraid of those who simply want a safe shelter, distracts us so we don't notice the rich getting richer, when a man in Gaza's dying words, a man who dared to go and get a bag of flour for his mum and was shot for his pains, are, please make sure mum gets this flour, then I want to be a sheeple. I don't want someone else to be forced to lose their life because I've been fooled by the powers that be, because I have remained silent or because I've chosen not to see. I want to put my own comfort to one side I want to notice, I want to speak out, I want to follow my shepherd who is loved by his father because he willingly gave up his life and then after lived once more. And so defeated despair, defeated despondency and finally defeated death. I am a sheeple of hope. I choose to follow the one who gives life so that others might live. Let us pray. Powerful God, source of all life, giver of all that we know, air, water, earth, 
warmth, light, life itself. We stand in gratitude for the completeness of life, the wholeness of creation. Help us to be continually grateful, never forgetting the grace by which we are called to abide in God through Jesus Christ. We bring our prayers for all unable to share in the rich resources of the earth, those who are deprived of food, warmth, and a fulfilling life, those who are exploited, working in the extraction of resources from the ground. We pray for those who are engaged and employed in caring for others, for those who carry responsibilities for family members, for those who work in caring professions, and for those who receive care. May their dignity be respected and remain intact. We pray for all who create human communities, who bring people together for enjoyment, for sport, music, art, hobbies, and those who do so for mutual support and to mobilize for change. We pray for the church. May she always be a place of belonging open and responsive to all. May the tremendous treasure of wisdom deposited within her inform and enrich the world. And we pray for the community of nations, so challenged at this time, praying that conflicts will be avoided rather than inflamed. Empower us in the way of the gospel, Enable us to be true disciples of the Good Shepherd. Teach us, good Lord, to serve thee as thou deservest, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for any reward, save that of knowing that we do thy will. And we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
us as we go. Go make a difference in the world. Go make a difference. We can make a difference. Go make a difference in the world. Make a difference. Go make a difference. We can make a difference. Go make a difference in the world. Again. Go make a difference. We can make a difference. Go make a difference in the world. Go make a difference. We can make a difference. Go make a difference in the world. Go make a difference in the world. Thank you very much for coming along this morning. Uh, special thanks to Alessandro, to Rosalina, to Anthony for some wonderful music. Special thank you to Neil for some wonderful storytelling and poetry. Um, it kind of reminds me how important it is to keep telling those stories because we don't tell them. <laughs> and they are, well, they are our history. It's our, it's our ancestors, you know, so it's important to keep those traditions. So thank you. Um, special thank you to Vaughan for what I thought. I thought it was a good sermon. I, um, <laughs> he was complaining to me in the office about it being rubbish, but I thought it was a great sermon. So. <laughs> um, special thank you to uh, Claudina and Rachel for reading. It? Yep, yep, it was you two reading. Uh, to Poria and to Constantine for doing the tech, and to Fariad for helping a little as well. <laughs> um, have I thanked everyone? Yes. I think I have. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, no, I'm not, not into, you know, giving myself praise. Praise be to you. Know, amen. Um, so... Well, on Tuesday, we are continuing our Bible studies in Mark's Gospel, and there's a very particular question that we're looking at. <laughs> so, in, in Mark's Gospel, there's a very, there's a very unusual moment when, when a man escapes the kind of grasp of Roman soldiers, and then he, but, that, but then they get his cloak and he runs away naked, and I guess we're looking at whoever that guy was. Um, <laughs> So that, that's Bible study on Tuesday at 7 p.m. We do them online and in person. Um, so you can come here in person to do them. Um, and I will probably be at the gate unless you're here after 7, in which case just ring the buzzer. Uh, or we do it online via Zoom. If you want the Zoom link, just let me know and I'll add you to our Bible study list. Um, and then we've got a folk sing-along with Union Chapel Singers. Um, it's going to be fun. There's a singer right there, if I can see her. Hello. There are and three there. singers. Hello. <laughs> we've, got a few, we've got a few singers about here. So um, it's Union Chapel Singers, our community choir. They do lots of events like this where they try to bring the community together and bring our voices together and express and feel good. So head along to that. Uh, on Wednesday the 1st, this is, this is one that um, Juan was really the main organizer of. Uh, this is, it's Amazonian Dreams. So it's kind of puppetry. It's already sold out, but you can come along. <laughs> Just, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll squeeze you in somewhere. Um, but it's, it's already sold out, but it's kind of, it's meant to be quite surrealist, but it's puppetry, dance, and music. Uh, from Latin, it says, you're from Latin America, but mainly Peru and Bolivia is kind of where the cultural traditions are coming from for this event. So I'd recommend coming along to that. That should be a good event. And, and I, I didn't, I, just to let you know, I, didn't, I don't write these service sheets. Um, <laughs> so I definitely didn't put on there that I'm like in big, bold letters that, <laughs> that the next service is one that I'm leading. But, um, but unfortunately, I am leading that service. So come along 
um, if you dare. <laughs> um, and that's about it. Great. We've got some leaflets at the back, uh, some new leaflets, and there's going to be tea and coffee. Thank you. Thank you. Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. Jesus draw you to himself. The power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. The joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen.
I have one more announcement to make. Poria, who has been coming to our church for quite a while now, this is going to be his last day for a while. Uh, he's been helping out with our tech, um, and he's generally just been a really good sport. So please um, just give him the warmest, warmest of goodbyes uh, when we go for coffee. Um, we, will, we will see him again one day, I'm sure, but we'll, we, we're not entirely sure when. So just want to let you all know. Thank you.